Hello and welcome to the Amplifying Scientific Innovation podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Sophia Onoye Onye, founder and CEO of the Sophia Consulting Firm, a life science marketing and communications consultancy that was established in New York City with the goal of amplifying scientific innovation. The goal of this podcast is to showcase scientific innovation stemming from global life science companies through unique conversations with biotech leaders who share their leadership journey, their corporate vision, and industry outlook. My guest today is Mr. Joseph E. Payne, founder, president, and CEO at Actors Therapeutics, a leading clinical stage messenger RNA medicines company that is focused on the development of infectious disease vaccines and significant opportunities within liver and respiratory rare diseases. Joe has served on the board of actors since March 2013 and is well respected in the industry for his exceptional track record of ushering novel therapeutics to the clinic, including successful experience developing sophisticated RNA nanoparticle medicines. His multidisciplinary background includes over 20 years of successful drug discovery experience at Merck, DuPont Pharmaceuticals, and Bristol Myers Squibb, to mention but a few. His dedication to scientific innovation is evidenced by over 40 publications and patents. Joe holds a bachelor's degree in chemistry from Brigham Young University, a master of science degree in synthetic organic chemistry from the University of Calgary, and executive training certification from MIT Sloan School of Management. I learned about actors following Joe's recent interviews at CNN and other major media outlets. I was highly impressed by the company's planting vaccine to the market, as well as the company's strong relationships with the Israeli Ministry of Health. And I invited Joe to the podcast so I could learn more about the state of science at actors and of course, share it with the public. Welcome to the show, Joe. Hey, Sophia, it's good to be with you. Uh, and, my pleasure. Uh, and uh, by the way, as I mentioned to you earlier, I love your background. San Diego is beautiful. I lived there for almost a year. And uh, now that I'm back in, in the East Coast, I, I still crave the San Diego weather from time to time. Yes, it's, uh, it's, a, it's a great place to live, raise a family, uh, definitely build a business. Uh, it's a great place to recruit talent. Uh, for many reasons. The weather's great. People are great. Very fortunate to be here for sure. <laughs> Wonderful. And so I'll start with my favorite question, or at least one of my favorite questions, which is, what is your definition of scientific innovation? Oh, that's a great question. Innovation, right? This is the concept of creativity. Um, mm. You know, I've always been taught that uh, money can't buy love, but it can't buy, <laughs> it, it can't buy innovation either. This, is, a, this right. is the creative aspect of what we do that's really exciting. The ideas put into practice, um, and, it, and it's something that uh, you can learn it, but it, it, it's, it's just uh, uh, there's some people that are more creative than others in science. Mm -hmm. That's where innovation really has a lot of sizzle or uh, mm -hmm. uh, excitement the ability to come up with solutions that no one's ever thought of before. That's what scientific innovation is and putting it into practice. Uh, we like to consider Arcturus a, an innovative culture founded by a couple scientists that value innovation. And that's where a lot of value creation is, is built in, in biotechnologies through this you know, scientific innovation. Great. So creativity, right, and value creation are some of the key ingredients to scientific innovation. Very well said. So my follow-on question for you, and, and I've been told that this question is like asking you to pick a favorite child, uh, but what do you think is your most significant professional or scientific accomplishment to date? Well, coming off the question about innovation, I, I, I think... Uh, uh, back in 2013, uh, when Arcturus was first founded, it was myself and Pat Chivakula. He's the chief scientific officer of Arcturus. Uh, we were two mm -hmm. scientists, excited. Uh, we were entrepreneurial at the time. We just quit our jobs and set up a new company mm -hmm. in an incubator. And uh, we were coming up with some ideas. And, and uh, uh, ideas around delivery. Uh, we want to safely and effectively deliver these 
valuable RNA molecules. They have the potential to impact medicine, right? So, but how we get these RNA molecules to where they need to be, right? Is we design these little spheres called nanoparticles and they're, and they're based upon uh, chemical compounds called lipids. And we had ideas around this. And uh, this process of innovation was, was energetic and exciting early in the company. Or you have a very short runway. So you have to, it's like necessity is the mother of invention, right? So it was during this period of time and we had some ideas and uh, we put them into practice and we tested them. And, and I'll always remember on, uh, it was a Sunday morning in a September in 2013. Mm. And I remember it was Sunday morning because it's an unusual time for somebody to call you. It was like Sunday at 7 a.m. And so usually, sometimes those can be bad news type, type calls, right? right. But, but so I, of course, I got the call to see what, who, who, who's calling me Sunday morning at 7 a.m. And it was my uh, uh, business partner, Pat Chivakula. And he said, uh, check your data. It's in your email. And he hung up. <laughs> so I, I went and checked it. And it was there that I saw this beautiful data set that very few people in the world at the time would have even understood it. Uh, because what we were doing was cutting edge and new. But it was then. I knew right then. That was now six, seven years ago, right? Seven years ago almost to the day that I... Uh, that I knew that we had discovered something that was going to have the potential to uh, change the world, right? This type of con uh, concept. And, uh, it was just early data in mice, but I, I, it was the best I've ever seen. And it was really exciting mm -hmm. to be part of something that, that we've discovered something that has a lot of potential to make an impact. And, and that, that uh, is wonderful. Little, little did I know that seven, eight years later, or, uh, we'd be here talking on a podcast with Sophia. <laughs> but, uh, I, would, I would say that that was my most significant impact as a scientist, for sure, was the discovery of a, a technology that can uh, you know, effectively deliver valuable RNA molecules to where they need to be in animals. That's wonderful. That, that's really good to know. And if we take a step back, I'm curious about what attracted you to begin with uh, to the field of RNA-based therapeutics? Oh, the complexity and the simplicity at the same time. So RNA mm. works very, like you and I were made with RNA. Um, RNA is, builds everything in our bodies, our cells, our, our enzymes, our hormones, everything's made with RNA. So it's such a valuable chemistry in nature. It's very simple. Your body takes your, your DNA that you get from your mom and your dad, it gets converted to RNA, and then the RNA does all the work and it makes a whole bunch of stuff, right? So these RNA molecules have been known forever. They're very simple. If you, if you can get RNA to where it needs to be, it can build mm -hmm. and create life in a living human person. So that's always been very interesting to me. But the complexity of how you get this beautiful, simple molecule that nature totally understands, how do we get this to where it needs to be as a medicine? Uh, and this concept of RNA delivery was fascinating to me as a chemist. I, uh, that's where the core of my scientific training is around synthetic organic or medicinal chemistry. And, and so these beautiful, complex nanoparticle Delivery technologies were fascinating to me. They were, uh, it was a, uh, just a, uh, at the time, I, I, I realized that there was very few companies doing it. There was, uh, it wasn't outsourceable. There wasn't a phone that you could pick up and say, hey, could you make these for us? It was mm -hmm. something you had to do yourself and had the innovation had to be done by you. Um, mm -hmm. and, and I like that. So I like the complexity of the beautiful simplicity of it and the potential impact it could have in, in the field of science and medicine. So th for those, those are the reasons that I, I dove into it and, and decided to make a career of it. I, I like the duality of the simplicity and complexity. I'm a medicinal chemist by training. And of course, when you speak about RNA, I, I studied epigenetics as a PhD student. And I'm like, yeah. I get very excited because it, it starts with some of those simple 
principles that you learn in your molecular biology class or even biology 101. And then you have brilliant people like yourself, they're able to take science plus entrepreneurship and turn it into something that will change people's lives all over the world. So congratulations on that. Thank you. Likewise. My <laughs> so uh, my next question for you is about the name of the company, Actors. I'm sure that you people probably asked you about that. So what is the meaning uh, behind the name of the company and what is your vision for the future? Sure. So first, the name of the company, Arcturus, is, a, is the brightest star in the northern hemisphere. So there's certain expressions that people are familiar with, like when you wish upon a star, that's yes. Arcturus. That's Arcturus. That's the star you're wishing upon. Uh, and, and, you know, the, the starlight, star bright, first star I see tonight, that, that's mm -hmm. Arcturus. Uh, it was mm -hmm. used by uh, the indigenous peoples here as, as a guide to help them know where to go. Uh, so, you know, it's one of these names that's unusual when you first see it. But as you get to know the name and the story behind it, there's a lot of meaning behind Arcturus, the star. and 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 I thought it would be appropriate to name uh, uh, our our new company after that. And, and Pad Chivakula and I, we were excited about the name, and, and we decided to proceed with it. Um, so the, and we thought there were certain marketing handles at some time when you're a, a new startup. You're like, hey, maybe we'll have products at some point, and people can, uh, you know, people look at these products to be hopeful that they can help them uh, deal with their disease or their problem. And so it fits into the whole theme of, of medicine and helping others. So uh, we thought it was a, a great name there. With respect to the vision of the company, we're an RNA medicines company, and we wanted to uh, apply our innovative technologies to, to go after new diseases using RNA medicines. Um, if you can get these RNA medicines to different cell types, different types of cells in your body, there's more, there's opportunity there to help people with diseases associated with those cells. So we, we, we just came up with new delivery solutions for whether you uh, inject somebody in the arm or in intravenously for an intravenous application or inhale the messenger RNA therapeutics for, for diseases in the lungs. We, we looked at all three of these and we've been, over the last several years, we've been optimizing and innovating in, in delivery technologies to these different cell types and then building a pipeline of therapeutics that utilize these technologies to hopefully help a lot of people suffering from different types mm -hmm. of diseases. And that's, that's mm -hmm. the vision of the company. That's great. Uh, now I would like you to tell me just a little bit more um, about the work that you're doing specifically as it relates to COVID-19. Yeah, so uh, one of the technologies we were working on is called self-replicating RNA, which is ideally uh, uh, designed for vaccine applications. We've been working on it for years. We got ready for prime time relief, and, and we did a press release last November saying, we've got this new product. It's called S-T-A-R-R, -R, STAR is the trademark of it, self-transcribing and replicating RNA. And we combined it with our lunar technology, and we did a press release last November. Um, and literally weeks after that, uh, the government of Singapore approached us mm. and they wanted to evaluate mm. these technologies for application for COVID, which was an epidemic at the time, very early. Uh, people weren't really worried about it in, in the US yet, we're curious, um, but it was at the forefront of everyone's minds in Singapore at the time, being at the forefront of this epidemic. And so they evaluated these technologies, they evaluated our staff, our team, our capabilities around manufacturing these sorts of vaccines, and it ended up consummating into a, uh, an agreement with the government of Singapore. They brought in the Duke NUS Medical School that's based in Singapore as well. Now Duke NUS is a combination of Duke Medical School here in the United States, and NUS mm -hmm. is National University of Singapore in Singapore. These two entities came together and created a third ent uh, entity called Duke NUS, and they're world experts in pathogenic and infectious disease research, especially coronaviruses, which people are now familiar with, but you have uh, uh, MERS and SARS and now COVID-19. So we were fortunate to work with them as we developed these exceptional technologies 
and into a, a COVID-19 vaccine. And it's been a very successful collaboration. We've worked really well with them and we've discovered a vaccine and, and now translated and, and transitioned this uh, uh, vaccine into the clinic and in, in human clinical studies. And that's where it stands presently and we're excited to track its progress. Uh, that's really great. And um, I had read a recent press release about a new relationship that you have with the Israeli Ministry of Health. Can you tell us more about that? That's right. Uh, in addition to you know, some agreements and contracts with the government of Singapore, we uh, uh, had the opportunity to discuss our vaccine candidate with the government of Israel. The Israeli Ministry of Health evaluated our vaccine candidate. And these were the scientists um, at the Israeli Ministry of Health, the PhDs, the MDs, the professors. Uh, they went through a thorough investigation of our vaccine candidate and our preclinical data set and, and, and got them really excited about the, its potential. And so they uh, executed a, a supply agreement, which means that we'll have the opportunity if, if the vaccine proves to be successful in the clinical trials that uh, we could play a key role in vaccinating the country of Israel. And so that, it's been a great experience. We also met with the finance group at the government of Israel as well. And they were attracted to the vaccine because it can potentially save the government of Israel and their taxpayers a lot of money because our, our, our vaccine has certain uh, advantages to it with respect to mm -hmm. how long it lasts. Um, mm -hmm. So less frequent injections, for example, to uh, how it's stored and, and how it's distributed from a cold chain or supply chain perspective. Um, mm -hmm. it, it's less expensive to, we, it's likely not to require extraordinary freezers or dry ice handling or mm. anything. Like that. So because of these uh, unique cost saving features, the finance group at uh, the, the Ministry of Finance at, uh, in Israel was also attracted. So it wasn't just the Ministry of Health, it was the finance team but uh, uh, yeah, this summer we executed a supply agreement uh, that uh, we hope we'll, we can play a key role in vaccinating the, the citizens of Israel in addition to uh, the citizens of Singapore. Right, and of course the citizens of the US and potentially the whole world. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah. And, then, uh, and speaking of that, you, you, you drew on something that a lot of people don't realize that of the hundreds of vaccines being tracked by the WHO and the RAPS tracking system, that, that there's relatively few US, US headquartered companies that have advanced a COVID-19 vaccine into the clinic. There's approximately six of them are US headquartered. And of those, some would suggest only four of these vaccines that are in the clinic were discovered right here in the US. And Arcturus mm -hmm. is one of them. So we're one of a, 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 just a few. Um, and we're very proud of the, the U.S. innovation and the innovation that we've brought forward with this vaccine. It is different than the others. And uh, at least preclinically in animals, it looks like there's some significant benefits. And we're excited to see this story play out into the clinic and hopefully we'll, have, we'll be fortunate to have uh, good results in humans as well. Oh, thank you for that brilliant summary. As I said, I selfishly wanted to learn more about your company and you've done a great job uh, telling me about that. Now I want to take a step back and if you think about scientific innovation um, from a holistic perspective, how do you think that the biotechnology industry has changed in the past, I will say 15 years or so, and, and what are some loopholes uh, within the industry, in your opinion, of course? Yeah, uh, well, the, the biotechnology industry has certain generations associated with it. Um, they, they started with the snake oil salesman, you know, and herbs and some herbs were great, some natural products weren't, and, and there was no regulation. So they went through this regulation phase, testing phase, and realized that a lot of these natural products really didn't do anything. So there was regulation that gets involved. And then scientists came in and made some unique discoveries that certain chemicals have certain products. And so you had this phase of small molecules, and that's where you get everything from the acetaminophens of Tylenol. Mm -hmm. and, and pain reducers to, to antibiotics, right? Like the penicillins of mm -hmm. the world. It's just great innovation. We have this, I'll say this accelerated innovation and, and progress with small molecule um, uh, therapeutics. But then there was a new revolution of biologics. These are large, mm -hmm. complex bi biological molecules like antibodies and, 
humanized antibodies. And they, they, they found a, a role to, to address some serious unmet medical needs. And I would call that a new generation. So that brings us to this, what's, you're asking what's happening in the next 15 years. I think that bodes, mm -hmm. that fits really well with what Arcturus, we're in the middle of this new revolution of yeah. RNA medicines, I call it. Mm -hmm. Because these RNA molecules have the ability to build and create life in a living person. This has never happened mm -hmm. before. So imagine if somebody's missing a protein, if they're missing mm -hmm. an enzyme, that you go in and build them a new one, something that they're missing. Right now, the entire pharmaceutical industry has you know, billions and approaching trillions of dollars of drugs that treat disease. The downstream effects of it, the swelling, the pain, the cholesterol, the, the uh, you know, uh, uh, you know, the, the, the cancers, you know, right? But mm -hmm. instead of mm -hmm. instead of treating the disease, why don't you just mm -hmm. replace what's missing? Because mm -hmm. disease is caused by something being dysfunctional or missing in our human body. Mm -hmm. And that's what RNA can do. Why don't we, we, we evaluate the person, the doctor can go, hey, you're missing something. Why don't we replace it to make you like everybody else? You know, mm -hmm. the, we all know the example of of, uh, you know, someone, is, you know, these, these uh, marathon runners who collapse with a heart mm -hmm. attack. They should mm -hmm. be extremely healthy, but they just don't, they're missing something. And so they get cardiovascular disease and they die. And then there's other people that don't run a day in their life and they live to their 95 <laughs> years old. Right. And because they're ticker, their heart is a genetically normal, health, you know, healthy heart. They're just, they're not missing anything. They don't have any mm -hmm. dysfunctional proteins that cause any impact. So this concept is applied to every organ and tissue and cell type in the body. So if a cell is missing a protein, why don't you get that RNA molecule into that cell and have that cell miss and build it and replace what they're mm -hmm. what's dysfunctional. And by doing that, all the drugs go away. If you mm -hmm. have no more disease, you have no inflammation, no pain, no swelling, no no other issues. So it's very disruptive. This next phase is going to be very exciting. So there, um, there's a lot of expectation right now for RNA medicines to play a, a dramatic role in shifting how we view medicine. And we're, Arcturus is one of the many companies out there, a lot of great ones. And we're, we're, we're excited to be a part of it. Yeah, well, it comes back to what you had mentioned earlier about the duality of simplicity and complexity. Sometimes that's really all it takes, understanding how you can take that molecular knowledge of cells, of RNA, and build it into a system and a company, therapies that can save people's lives all over the world. So thank you for just the elegant way you described that. Yeah, um, just, just, to inter just to interject really quick, Sophia, I, 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 was, yeah. I, I now notice that children are being taught genetics. Yeah. They used to wait until junior yeah. high or high school. But genetics yeah. is really simple. You got DNA yeah. that gets converted <laughs> to RNA that <laughs> makes protein. But, but then what's complicated, what requires graduate degrees and PhDs and MDs <laughs> is how do you get that RNA to where it needs to be? And that's, right. the, that's the complexity is... It's, the path is beautifully simple, but how do we get that RNA molecule, you know, how do we inject it and it, it finds its way to the right cell and gets in the cell and releases it? You know, that, that's the beautiful complexity. Yep, and that's where the innovation comes from, right? So you talked about creativity as well as value creation. So if you can put those two, two things together, then it doesn't make it seem so intimidating, right? Complexity could be simplified, but you have to be willing to take the time, as you say, to really understand it. So yep. now that we've covered, <laughs> now that we've covered some of those uh, philosophical um, statements, yeah. I think I'll be curious to know, again, just uh, in full transparency or as honest as you can be, what do you think we could have done differently to mitigate the impact of COVID-19 as an industry? Oh, to minify that. Uh, well, I think the, <laughs> to mitigate the impact, that's such a great question. Uh, I think first step one is removing the naivete uh, mm. We'll call it the ignorance. And uh, I think now that 
a pandemic can happen to us in this period, in our day, the fact that this has happened, I think people now realize that it can happen again and they're not mm -hmm. going to ignore it. They're not going to naively dismiss it. They're going to take it serious that a pandemic like this can happen again with a different pathogen. Mm -hmm. So your question is first, there, there's a big step in just removing the naivete and, mm -hmm. and making sure that people take it seriously. And an example of that is the WHO presented uh, coronaviruses in 2015 to the countries mm -hmm. of this world, four years before it, it had an outbreak. If we would have listened to the WHO back in 2015, we would have had vaccines prepared definitely enough to deal with an outbreak. You don't need to make billions of vaccines to deal with a small little outbreak. You just quarantine the area and vaccinate the immediate surroundings and it's done. And this would have been a completely non-issue. So I, I think we already have everything in place, but the yeah. seriousness and the fortitude and, and the naivete is no longer there. So I think we don't really have to change too much. I think we've just learned our lesson is what I'm getting right. at, aside, including me, <laughs> including me, right. I, 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 I wouldn't have, uh, uh, I, I wouldn't have directed our tourists to become a vaccine company. And now <laughs> here, here we are absolutely engaged in vaccine companies because the pharmaceutical industry, just frankly, as a whole, there's some companies that always have, but some companies uh, just did not take it seriously that, mm -hmm. that something like this could happen. And that, and that's no longer the case. I think, uh, uh, countries have learned their lesson that we will stockpile in accordance to WHO recommendations or at least some intermediate, you know, improvement. And, uh, and I think we're going to be much, much, much more prepared for some sort of uh, pandemic or endemic. And, and, and what we've learned through all this innovation from all of these vaccines that are being evaluated, that RNA vaccines are very quick to move. Uh, you know, mm -hmm. Pfizer and Moderna have done an exceptional job being first movers because mm -hmm. of the simplicity of the vaccine mm -hmm. that we've referenced already. And because of the clock speed, it's called. It's very quick to design something and implement it. So if we have the platform validated, then you can quickly do it. Now at Arcturus, we're not, we're not a conventional messenger RNA vaccine like, uh, the, the, I, like uh, Pfizer and Moderna, for example, Arcturus mm -hmm. utilizes a self-replicating or self-transcribing mm -hmm. RNA. So this is new cutting edge technology that's being validated as we speak in human clinical trials. Once it's validated, to make a new vaccine is super fast and super simple. Right. So right. everything else is the, com the complex part that we talked about, that delivery technology. Yeah getting it to the right yeah. myocytes, the muscle cells and the dendritic cell, that's all worked out. And all we mm -hmm. have to do is take out the payload and switch it with another uh, RNA molecule. So very quick, we could ramp up and have vaccines in lightning speed. Uh, and so that's, that's a learning that the community has learned, but Arcturus has specifically learned that we're very well positioned to move very quickly. If there's another pandemic that we're ill prepared for, something completely different, for example. No, oh, I mean, I, I couldn't agree with you more. I could literally spend one more hour just talking to you about some of the, some of the insights I gained from, from what you just said. Because the, the one thing, though, for me is the, the not in my backyard approach to developing medicines. We cannot have that anymore because we are, the world is, is so global. I mean, you yeah. cannot think that what's happening in China might not affect you here in the U.S. So I think it was definitely a wake-up call. And, and thanks to companies like yours, we have been able to have hope and optimism for the future. So that's really a step in the right direction. Yeah, yeah. 2021 is going to be the year of vaccinations. And there's going to be many companies involved in vaccinating many, many countries. We hope to be one of them, uh, with not only mm -hmm. Singapore and Israel, but hopefully many others. Uh, uh, is what we're hoping to and striving for, for sure. Great. So we, we've talked quite a bit about your company. Um, I'm curious to know if there's any technology or any other company that you're currently excited about. And it's okay if you're just really excited about your company too. So, so tell sure. me, what are your thoughts? No, no, I think I, within, the, within the field of where my passion, where my excitement is, and you probably picked up on it, is on RNA medicines as a whole. Mm 
-hmm. It's very disruptive. Mm -hmm. It can transform the field of medicine, not, not just help with a, a mild drug that helps with some sort of symptoms. No, this is disruptive, curative. Um, it can normalize serious diseases, uh, etc. So, so within the, the, we'll call it the sandbox, the, the RNA sandbox, there's a lot of exciting uh, different types of RNA medicines. Uh, many on this podcast may have heard of uh, gene editing therapeutics. Mm -hmm. uh, these are RNA molecules that go into a cell and instead of making a protein or a hormone, it makes a pair of genetic scissors that literally cuts out the diseased DNA. Like how awesome is that? Imagine if you had this diseased DNA and you were, and, and you were uh, uh, born with a horrible disease that's because your DNA was mutated. Imagine if you could just make a pair of scissors that cuts it out and that's what gene editing does. Um, and I think that's exciting, wow. but that's an RNA medicine that goes into a mm -hmm. cell and makes a pair of scissors that cuts the DNA in the right spot, of course. And there's a lot of exciting yeah. companies there that I'm tracking. Um, I, I think the RNA vaccines that are going after cancer is very exciting. Mm -hmm. Uh, mm -hmm. The reason why some people get cancer when they're 30 and others never get cancer is again, because they're missing mm -hmm. something. Okay, mm -hmm. they, they, they were born with a deficiency that they don't know about, and that deficiency leads to an increased likelihood of getting cancer. And cancer is just uncontrolled growth of cells, and, they, and these uncontrolled growth of cells happen because the, the person's missing something. Right. And so, if we right. can understand this concept, we can prophylactically or prevent cancers, or we can re educate the body to go, hey, I know you're missing this. We're going to replace that. And so, uh, and let me back up a bit. When, when people get cancer, their body takes care of it. When normal, healthy people mm -hmm. see a little bit of cancer that happens in our body, our body says, hey, what the heck is that? And it eats it and gets mm -hmm. rid of it. So if someone has cancer and they're not taking care of it themselves, why not inject them with an RNA medicine that says, hey, mm -hmm. you've got cancer. <laughs> and then, and mm -hmm. then they can eat it and, and take care of it themselves. Instead of uh, giving some sort of toxic chemotherapeutic yeah. that is toxic to the whole body and it just happens to be more mm -hmm. toxic than cancer, and everyone's familiar with chemotherapy, but, but why not just educate the body or replace what's missing so that they can healthily and normally deal with the cancer like you and I are dealing with our cancers day to day. We get rid of it and we don't even know we had it. Mm -hmm. So. So it, this, so I'm excited about the cancer vaccine space that for RNA for cancer vaccines, uh, and then and then finally, I think um, I, I I'm just interested in this new field of messenger RNA therapeutics. This concept of building uh, not only what's missing, but imagine the concept of getting more of what's good. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now, this is, mm -hmm. this is a, a, an exciting concept to wrap your mind mm -hmm. around. But mm -hmm. we have good proteins in our body, and it would be great if we had more of it. Mm -hmm. So that our memory is exceptional instead of average. That our mm -hmm. IQ is exceptional instead of average. Our sight is better instead of average. We've got mm -hmm. great proteins in our body. Why not make them better? So this mm -hmm. concept of, of taking what's good that we've been born with and making it even better. Uh, that, that's, a, you know, that's a new type of cosmetic application. Look at, look at like, like, what do we do for cosmetics of the face? Instead of replacing what's missing, we inject a toxin into our face to make it look dead. Okay, so this is what we do now. We kill wow, the face, yeah. we toxify the face. <laughs> So instead of that, why not inject an RNA molecule that replaces mm -hmm. what's missing? As we age, mm -hmm. we start to drop some proteins. The collagen goes away. Why not inject our face with RNA that replaces the collagen? Or, mm. or uh, makes us youthful and vital again. The, as, as we age, people feel older and older. Why? Because <laughs> the proteins we used to make aren't there anymore. So why not give ourselves a, a like we do with our cars, we go in and and give us a, a, a quick re refresher at the mechanics. <laughs> so, so I'm engaged and interested in these type of therapeutics that uh, 
vitalize the human being, that make it better, make it uh, live longer, happier. Not because most some of these drugs that we have now extend life, but do we really want that? You know, do we do we right. just want to extend our right. late years and, and that may be relatively miserable? No, we want to <laughs> vitalize our, our life, and I think RNA therapies does that. And there's some companies that are working on on that that I'm tracking. But back to Arcturus, I, of course, I'm biased. I think our company is um, one of the more exciting ones to track uh, because we uh, have an exciting vaccine. We have an exciting liver franchise, an exciting lung franchise. Mm -hmm. And there's many, many liver diseases, many, many lung diseases um, that we can potentially go after. If, 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 our, if our flagship assets in each of those franchises work, then we have mm -hmm. a very exciting company to, to track for sure. That's wonderful. And we can get more of what is good. I, I really like that. I think that's important uh, for, for innovation. So as we think broadly, uh, my second to last question is a bit more philosophical. But, but what do you think will be important for sustaining innovation in the life science industry? Oh, uh, well, I I innovation... All right, I've, I've just touched on two concepts here. So what is the mother of innovation? Necessity, okay? Mm -hmm. Necessity is the mother of innovation, not surplus. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Money kills innovation. Mm. So, let me, so people think mm. money buys innovation and it doesn't. It buys products and manufacturing capabilities and, and effort and, and, and quantities, but it doesn't buy innovation. Necessity is the mother of innovation. Mm. So what's mm. really important to maintain uh, an innovative efficacy, okay, this continuous fire of innovation, is you need to have young companies, young entrepreneurs mm. that are not wealthy, that, 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 are, that have the, the hunger to innovate. Mm -hmm. And you also need to, and the other reason why uh, America, even though they finish well below in all test scores throughout the planet, America continues to be the most innovative country in the world because it has a culture of innovation. It rewards innovation. It says, good job, that's creative, way to go, right? Mm. And, and, and it has laws that enable innovation. So as long as we continue to, as a group, as a democratic voice, vote and support innovation, then that's going to help. Uh, but if we are generous, but what I'm saying is it's different. You look at, uh, uh, I've always been fascinated by this topic that, that excess money that's intended to, to buy and stimulate innovation ends up, ends up squelching it. Uh, you, you have to have this hunger. You, you, need, you need entrepreneurship and innovation mm -hmm. that they, they need to innovate or their company collapses. And you only find this type of culture here in the United States, like really, like it's all over the place. You have incubators of, of many, many, many companies and they're all excited young entrepreneurs that are trying to make a difference. And, and these are the people that innovate because they get rewarded if they innovate. They don't get the money to innovate. Does that make sense? Uh, Maybe I'm saying it uh, differently. But, but, no, uh, I, I I think you bring on a, a very uh, interesting point because some people would argue for the opposite. They would say that if, if there are no investment dollars coming into these life science companies, then how do you sustain the innovation, right? Uh, because okay, we, we you, know what, you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, but those monies are used to translate innovation into practice, right? So mm -hmm. you're absolutely right, you need money to convert this innovation into practice. But that's an mm -hmm. execution element. That's mm -hmm. not innovation, that's execution. So you, you need to definitely apply monies to what, what, what's, you know, there's a, there's a lot of uh, great ideas that get shelved and never get converted into practice because there wasn't yeah. money available. So you need, you need a mechanism for the innovation to access those monies, uh, and, and uh, that's a different topic. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I would agree with you. I, I do think that if, if those entrepreneurs don't get rewarded with the money, 
then yeah. the innovation starts to dry up down. That's just oh, my own absolutely. two cents. If there's no carrot, <laughs> if there's no carrot. <laughs> there you go. There you, you go. Need, you, 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 you have to innovate because necessity, you're running out of time. Yes. But if yes. you do innovate, you get a carrot. That's that's yes. a wonderful motivator, absolutely. And 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 that's why we have to be very, very careful how we structure um, everything in this economy and how we tax it. I know there's a, mm -hmm. a new liberal movement. Some people are even calling it socialism. Um, I'm, and just for the record, I'm, I'm independent. I'm not Republican or Democrat. So probably no one listening mm -hmm. to this is going to like me. But, but uh, <laughs> uh, because I'm definitely in the middle somewhere. But I, I do recognize that it's important to structure the economy so that you always have that carrot. You always have to have the American dream, some form of it, so that people are striving for that. But we do not want to, we're becoming a more and more affluent country, and we just gotta make sure that that affluence doesn't stifle right. uh, creativity as well. People gotta be hungry right. for it, or else right. we won't see right. Yeah. Well, I've completely enjoyed speaking with you. And the, the final question is really yours to answer as you feel fit. Uh, do you have any, any other comments or, or uh, thoughts that you want to share before we wrap up? Oh, any thoughts or comments? No, I, I think, yeah. uh, I, I, you know, I think everyone that's listening to this has, has become um, familiar and many are now experts in vaccines. Uh, as we're navigating our way through this darn COVID-19 stage in our lives, right? Uh, but rest assured, I, I, I know all the key players in some capacity and, and their science and their people. And I have absolute confidence that we're gonna have uh, a lot of vaccines that are gonna be distributed um, uh, likely next year. And um, uh, I wish it was uh, in, in the next few weeks, but it'll take a, a few quarters of uh, uh, we'll, we'll likely need the entire year next year to get through this pandemic. Mm -hmm. But remember that after we vaccinate people, it's not over. Uh, we're gonna enter an endemic phase and be a more mature society and realize mm -hmm. that we have to manage the flu, that we have to manage mm -hmm. COVID-19 and we have to be smarter and more humble in mm -hmm. preparing for the next pandemic. And if we do that, mm -hmm. then I think uh, society as a whole is going to learn a ton and we're going to look back a generation from now we're going to look back at how we handled this and be uh, this is such an important crucial time in our history and how we handle this and I think we're we're going to do a good job we'll see uh, very well said uh, we cannot be naive anymore and we should approach scientific problems with some level of creativity while also providing value to, to patients I have completely enjoyed speaking with you and um, it's been a, a joy to have you here. And I completely, of course, look forward to staying in touch with you and to learn more about all the great work that you will continue to do as a CEO of Actuaries Therapeutics. So thank you. Yeah, thank you, Sophia. And thanks to all that are listening. And we'll, we'll reconnect at a later time, I'm sure. Bye for now. Yeah, bye for now. <laughs>